In this video, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of our textbook that we'll be using, Ecce Romani, which literally translates as, look, Romans. And the first textbook for Latin 1 is titled Meeting the Family, or you could just call it Ecce Romani 1 or Ecce 1 if you would like. One of the assignments that I'm going to give to you first is that uh, when you both physically have your book and I have on canvas the first seven or so chapters, including the introduction, uh, to tide us over until everybody is able to pick up a book who needs one. Uh, for those of you who are coming in person, obviously, it is going to be that you'll just get it when you come here. And for those of you who are option two, there's a uh, textbook distribution that you'll be able to take part in. But nevertheless, when you read the introduction, you uh, meet the family that we are going to be following along with. And the family that we are following along, uh, you can see them here on the front cover, essentially is the Cornelians. That is the name of the family as a whole. The father has the name particularly Gaius. So uh, he is Gaius, or you can call him Cornelius. Gaius Cornelius uh, is his prinomen and his nomen. He is married to uh, Aurelia, and they have two children together. Now, you have to understand that the family that we are going to come to know and follow around is not an ordinary family. By that I mean Gaius Cornelius, and I suppose I'll write down Cornelius for him, is a Roman senator. And as such, he is in the top 0.1% of all society in wealth and power. And it makes sense that we do have this kind of family that we would follow along, because in the ancient world, in the ancient Roman world, that is exactly the kind of people that we know most about. We don't know mostly about the vast majority of people as they suffered from horrible poverty and also terrible circumstances of their lives. And the reason why we don't know about them is because most of them were illiterate. They did not read and write. And the people who were of in the upper levels of society, like Cornelius, who even is above in the elite level of upper society, because again, he combines tremendous wealth with tremendous power that he possesses as a Roman senator, is because that is the kind of people who did do the reading and writing. And so the record, the written record that we have from the ancient world is a record from them and the kind of people that they would then write about was their own kind. And so it's not some sort of classism that necessarily our family is in the super upper echelon of Roman society. It's just that that's honestly who we know the most about because of that written record. They have two children, do Gaius and Aurelia. They have a roughly 14-year-old boy named Marcus, his prinomen. And remember, the naming convention is that the daughter is always named the feminine version of the nomen. And so the daughter is named Cornelia. Now, when we meet the family, they also have a third child living with them. But it is not the biological child of Gaius and Aurelia. Instead, this child is a ward, as in he is being taken care of by Gaius and Aurelia because his father is off at war in another part of the Roman Empire and cannot take the child with him, and his mother is unfortunately dead because of an event that has occurred in the year previous of the action of our story. And that little boy that is a little bit younger than Marcus is named Sextus. Sextus is quite the rapscallion, gets into all kinds of shenanigans, and his antics help to drive a lot of the plot of what goes on in this family's life. Now, let's talk about when this story is taking place. And to do so, I will write down, as is always the case, my timeline. And I can't copy Mr. Kennedy with a woo, so I have to figure out my own eventually. So if I were to make the Roman timeline, obviously, you would start in April 21st, 753 BC. And you have to think about it in terms of that the Roman Empire as we know it is essentially going to last for around uh, 1,200 years, roughly. For it comes to an end in 476 AD. And as such, 
you have to understand that, let's say, 2,000 years from now, people were learning English from a textbook, and that textbook follows around an American family. Well, when and the circumstances of at what point in American history that family is living is going to tremendously affect a lot of their life circumstances. Because if we were to say, follow around an American family living in 1800, think about how vastly different their life would be than if the family is living now in 2020. And so for us, this is where you can find our family. First and foremost, just to give you a quick rundown of what the Romans had as far as a encapsulation of the history, is that they started out in the very early days with a monarchy. In other words, they were ruled over by kings. Well, just like us, they eventually got sick of them. In the same way that we told King George III to up your nose with a rubber hose, we're going to be independent, is that they kicked out the final king in the year 509, so they didn't have kings for long, just roughly about 250 years or so, and they started themselves a new type of government, which we call the res publica. And so the res publica is the republic in which there are bodies of the government, like a senate, and there are assemblies of the people, and you have governmental officials that we call magistrates, and so forth and so on. Well, just know, at some point in the res publica, and I usually arbitrarily give it this date of 133 BC, is that things got out of hand. Civil wars broke out, and it was all higgledy and piggledy, and there was civil strife, and this lasted for about a hundred years, until... Essentially, it emerged to where one man contained all of the power. You still had the res publica in place, but there was the man who finally had won all of the civil wars after a hundred or so years of the strife, and that man's name was Octavian, and even though there was still a senate, even though there were still the magistrates, even though there was still the structure of the res publica, it becomes clear to us as historians that Rome is no longer really a republic. It is what we like to call a principate, or some people just refer to it as the empire. Even though it had already been made into an empire, but ruled over by a res publica governmental structure, when you have that one guy who brought an end to the higgliness and piggliness at the end of the republic, and that guy's name again was Octavian, who is going to then get a new name, that is Augustus, for all intents and purposes, it is now ruled over by an emperor. And that's why we call it the Roman Empire. And so at this point, we have the empire. And it is during the empire that our family is living. And that is important to know because always hanging over the head of this family that we had just talked about, as well as every other family, even senatorial like our family is, is essentially the ultimate authority of all of Rome, which is that emperor. But for a long, long time... For over 700 years, they had no emperor in Rome. Instead, it was the res publica. But moving forward, now our family is living during the time of the emperors. And the year in which our story's action takes place is 80 AD. So around 80 years um, after the, the, the move to AD from BC and the advent of Christ in the traditional Western world of Christianity, that is when our family is living and conducting its business on a day-to-day -day basis. The name of the emperor at the time is Titus, a, one of the very few first emperors. Uh, he's within the first 12 emperors, essentially. And a huge event, huge event, has occurred in the year before our action takes place. And that would be, of course, in the year 79 A.D. And that event is incredibly important for our family because of where they are living when we first meet them. And it explains to us why that boy Sextus is living with them as well. So, let's talk about, then, our family and where they live. As they are senatorial in their status, they are going to be incredibly wealthy. Tremendously wealthy. And as such, they will have multiple residences, including in the city of Rome itself, and then, of course, their summer home and summer estate, which is where we will meet them. So, this, briefly, is a map of the entirety of the Mediterranean. 
just to zoom in, here is Italy and there is Rome. To zoom in further on Italy, there is the classic Boot Peninsula. Rome, right here, the great city, the center of the Roman Empire, is on a river known as the Tiber, T-I-B-E-R. And when we meet this family, they are not living in Rome. Instead, it is the summer, and they are living right here on the Bay of Naples. You can see the bay is outlined as it is right here, and so called the Bay of Naples because of Neapolis that is there. Now, on this Bay of Naples, the city or town where the Cornelians live is not Naples in and of itself. Instead, as I will show you here, they live at the resort town of Baiae. So spelled like this, by I, and it was an incredibly fashionable resort town where they reside. It'd be kind of like having a fancy vacation house in the summertime in the Hamptons, which is way out in Long Island, right in New York City, and really one of the most expensive places to have a house in the world because of its proximity to New York City, but that would be the kind of place to where our family would be staying for the summer. They have themselves a not only summer house, but it's a working farm. It's a working estate. Now, when you look at the Bay of Naples, that is right here, there is one dominating feature. And having been to the Bay of Naples several times myself, I can tell you, always looming over the Bay of Naples is this monster that is there. It is a volcano, and it is called Mount Vesuvius. And in the year 79 AD, which of course is one year before the action of our story is taking place, a cataclysmic event has occurred in that one of the most drastic, severe, and powerful eruptions in all of human history happened when Mount Vesuvius blew up. One third of its height exploded out and it filled just the sky all around the bay with millions upon millions upon millions of tons of debris. And so cataclysmic was this eruption that it completely and utterly destroyed three cities, one of which was inhabited by our little boy Sextus's mother, unfortunately, and that is most famously the city of Pompeii. It was buried in 40 feet of debris, dirt, and ash that bellowed out of Mount Vesuvius. And as a matter of fact, it remained buried for over a thousand years until around the 1500s, a farmer discovered as he was digging a well that he was trying to dig this well on what had been at one point the famous big city of Pompeii and we have been excavating it ever since. It is fascinating because it is truly as though the city itself was stopped in time on August 24th, 79 AD in which those cities were no more. We have found the locations of where people died in their tracks in the streets of Pompeii and we know exactly the positions that they were in their bodies when they died and all of life just simply froze in time buried in time and preserved in time due to that eruption. Most people did not die in the eruption however because they ran away. One would expect that you would when the mountain begins to explode. So that would be the cities of Pompeii even worse in its destruction is closer to the mountain, Herculaneum, and then obviously here is the city of Stabii. And so when we meet our family, it is only one year removed from that horrific eruption that completely destroyed those three cities, and here though, in that resort town of Baiae, is where live our family and where we are first going to encounter them, carrying on in not only an elaborate country estate that one would expect for a very wealthy family, but also it is going to be the functioning farm that would have to be, according to Roman tradition, the only appropriate occupation for a senator, certainly not to be a businessman. And so that's the circumstances where we meet them and the location. Eventually, they will, in a few chapters, be called to Rome, and it is at that point they will begin their journey, and that's what the second book of Ecce Romani that we use in Latin too is all about, their life 
in the city itself. But for book one, it is their life as they live in this little bitty town in the Bay of Naples, one year after that really cataclysmic eruption of Mount Vesuvius. So, hope you enjoy it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you.